The Apostle Paul is such an amazing source of teaching and guidance. I love the writings of the Apostle Paul. After King David, the Apostle Paul is my favorite character in the Bible. And I look forward one day to, to being able to, to, to have a chat to King David and the Apostle Paul. And, and I do look forward to being in eternity with those who have gone on before. And seeing the colors of heaven and all the things that we can only imagine down here. But one of the things I really appreciate about the Apostle Paul is that he was prepared to pay a price for his faith. There is something very real when you have to pay a price. It's easy if someone is giving away something for free, everyone wants it. But if you are prepared to pay a price for something, then it means you really want it. It's not just a case of, well, let me see what's going. It's the case of, I want this. It says something to me. If somebody is prepared to suffer for that in which they believe, because that tells me it is a true belief, otherwise they would have just thrown in the towel as soon as the price started to pick up. It tells me they believe that which they are going after. Like the Christians being martyred in the Middle East, they accept Jesus at a high price. Many have lost their life for turning to Jesus. That is true faith, true belief. The Apostle Paul didn't buckle under pressure. Hallelujah, we can learn from this man. He didn't just do what others told him to do because it was the, the atmosphere of the day. It was the common thinking of the day. Or it was the, the way the wind was blowing at that time. No, the Apostle Paul stood for what was right. He did what needed to be done despite the price that he paid. We read of all the tribulation which he had to endure for his faith in 2 Corinthians 11. Let me just read it to you. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors, more abundant. In stripes, above measure. In prisons, more frequently. In deaths, often. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeys often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, besides the other things, what comes upon me daily. Wow. The Apostle Paul was certainly prepared to pay a price for his belief. What are we prepared to pay? That's not the title of the message. The title of this morning's message is Having Done All. What do we do after having done all? But before we have done all, there are things we need to go through. The Apostle Paul had to go through all of these things. This was a real life encounter for him. This is history that you are reading. This isn't make believe what Paul went through, he actually endured these things. There are sufficient fair weather Christians in the world today. They say it's something like 2.3 billion people who identify as Christian in some way or another. But when I read the writings of Jesus, he says few will enter through the narrow gate. Certainly not 2.3 billion out of 7.5 billion. Few will enter the narrow gate. 
Who are those few? Those few are those who are prepared to pay the price because everyone else is going to bail on Jesus as soon as the price gets a little bit too high. You see, you have a, you have a pain threshold. If, if you were wanting to sell me, um, I don't know what, a chair, one of these chairs, and you said you want 50 rand for it, yeah, that's okay. You want 100? Mm, okay. 150, maybe 200. But it's eventually going to get to above my pain threshold to say, no, I'm not prepared to spend 800 rand for this chair. It is above my pain threshold. What is your pain threshold when it comes to serving Jesus? Because it needs to be your life. We need to be prepared to put our life on the line for our Jesus. We overcome the enemy through the blood of the Lamb, through the word of our testimony, and that we do not love our lives unto death. Do we love life more than we love Jesus? Be careful, we may disqualify ourselves from following. Reality kicks in when the pressure is on and the cost is involved. So what does the Apostle Paul say concerning perseverance and living this life we are living? Let's turn to Ephesians 6 to find out. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Now this is the last chapter of six chapters in this letter to the people of Ephesus. Finally, after everything he said in the five chapters, finally he comes to this. What does he come to? Put on the whole armor of God. And some people say, what do we need armor for? Aren't we supposed to be humble, loving, forgiving people? Why do we need armor? Yes, we are those things. But there is a very real enemy out there who is trying to take you out while you are being humble and loving and caring and forgiving he wants to take advantage of you and take you out. You are also told to be sober and to be vigilant. For your adversary, the devil, goes about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Have you noticed in the times in which we're living, how many willing helpers that this devil has in getting his work done here on earth? There is no shortage of devil helpers. In this world, those who are prepared to advance his agenda, those who are prepared to advance his thinking in this world, there is no shortage. People flock to help him, being quick to jump to his aid, especially when it, when it comes to the, the faith or the life of a believer. They are especially quick. When someone is loving God and trying their best to follow God and they want to pull the rug out from under their feet. It amazes me how many human elves have sided with the enemy and how eager they are to do his bidding. Sometimes they are more eager to do the devil's bidding than what we are to do God's bidding. Have you thought about that? Have you thought about those who are working against God? How diligent they work against Him. It puts us to shame sometimes. If we are serving our God, we need to do it with all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our soul, and all of our strength. We need to do it with all that's in us. Let's get back to our scripture. Verse 11 of Ephesians 6. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Sounds a bit scary that, doesn't it? Especially if you don't see yourself as a soldier in the Lord's army on the battlefield, which is indeed that which we are. If you don't see yourself as such a soldier, it can be so scary to read something like this. You are in a spiritual battle, whether you know it or not. If you are ignorant or if you ignore that fact, probably you aren't winning the battle. We need to be mindful of where we are at. 
And we need to be mindful that greater is he who is in me. I don't live in fear of the enemy. But we've got to be a wise and aware and be armored up. 2 Corinthians 10 says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. You need to have the mindset that we are mighty in God. It's the enemy who needs to have knees shaking when we wake up. Because, uh uh-oh, here they go again. God's army is on the move. It's not your wife or your husband that you're fighting. It's an accusing, lying, deceiving devil behind the scenes trying to cause division and pit you against one another. Dividing people is what he loves to do. He's the master of division. Divide black from white. Divide rich from poor. Male from female. Pitting the vaccinated against the unvaccinated. This is his strategy. And when people fall for it, they are siding with Satan and enabling his divisive agenda. We need to be aware of how the enemy functions. And then we need to be super careful not to be advancing his agenda. The principalities and powers mentioned in Ephesians 6 are far stronger than what we are in the flesh, which can be intimidating if you don't know a certain fact, that we don't face them in our strength. Our power and our authority comes from a much higher source. We come against them as young David came against Goliath. These were the words of David. You come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. David knew who he was in his God. He saw this massive giant, which everyone else was afraid of. And he took his eyes and he put it on his God. And he saw this ginormous, powerful God who was going to take down this giant before him. It mattered not to David that Goliath was much bigger, way stronger, far more armored up. What mattered to David was that the God of the armies of Israel was with him. He knew his God. God has assigned the archangel Michael as protector of, of Israel. Heaven help anyone who comes against Israel. The archangel Michael is watching over Israel. And you see it when David stood up and slayed Goliath. You see, when God is for you, who can be successfully against you? No matter how much they outnumber you or how much bigger They are, or how much uh, louder they scream. If God is for you, no one can be successfully against you. The name on which we stand is the name above all names, which God has exalted far above Ephesians 1.21. All principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. This is the name on which we stand. This is the authority in which we fight. Where is your gaze fixed? On the Goliaths of this world or on the name above all names? This passage regarding us not wrestling against flesh and blood is scary when we are looking in trepidation at the principalities and powers when we are in a woe is me mode. Do you know that mode? That woe is me. When we are marinated in the, in the juices of self-pity. And we look and we go, oh, I can't do this. These principalities and powers are too strong. We're not supposed to be looking at ourselves. We're not supposed to be wallowing in our self-pity. We're supposed to be looking to our God and declaring the victory. As a believer, we fight from a position of victory. Jesus has already beaten the enemy. 
We need to take the ground. But it has already been won. But if he can get, if the enemy can get our eyes on ourselves, and oh dear, look what's happening to me, then he can just walk in and he can take what he likes. He can loot your life as you just stand there looking at yourself, feeling sorry for yourself. Rise up, warrior! You are wearing the armor of God. This morning's message is not about the armor of God. I am not going into detail about the armor of God. There's something else I want you to catch this morning. Having done all, what do we do? After being armored up, what do we do? When our eyes are open and we understand that we are a godly warrior on His battlefield, doing His bidding, with our eyes fixed upon Him, we wrestle from a point of victory. In the knowledge that the anointed one has already won the battle and made a spectacle of the enemy. Verse 13. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all, you know what's coming next, folks. After having done all, what do we do? We stand. This is today's message. We need to learn how to stand. God has provided a full set of armor for each one of us. If we are functioning in it or not is our choice. It is, it's a done deal. It's already done. It's God's armor. Take up the whole armor of God. If it's God's armor, it's going to work. Because God has made it. You don't have to doubt it. You don't have to wonder if it's going to work. It will work because God has made it. It gives me great peace as the things of God work the way they're supposed to. It's the armor of God we need to be wearing that we may withstand in the evil day. Those days when everything comes crashing down upon you. You know those days. You've had them. But you remain standing because you're wearing the armor. You know you're wearing the armor. And you can stand. Putting on the armor makes good sense. But standing is what's going to give you the victory. The armor is only going to protect you against the blows that are coming in. It's not going to give you the victory. The standing, that perseverance, that is where you're going to find the victory. In whose authority do we stand? We stand in the authority of the name of Jesus, the name above all names. There comes a time when we have done all we can in accordance with God's word. Then we are to stand. When you've done everything that you can do, you stand. This standing, it describes a stubborn perseverance where we know what we are standing for, like the Apostle Paul. And we know in whose authority we are standing. The Apostle Paul could stand because he had vision to do that, which Jesus is, he was doing that for Jesus, which he was doing. He knew why he was standing. He knew in whose authority he was standing. To stand is to set your mind firmly and not budge. Like a knight on a chessboard protecting the king, you stand. Prepared to die at your station if called to do so. That stubborn persistence. Of standing. You don't permit your emotions to change your stance, you stand. You don't allow the tiredness of standing to cause you to lie down, no, you stand. You don't allow the incessant accusations and intimidations of the lies of the enemy to wear you down, you stand. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the bless, breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. That tells me that some attacks are going to come in while we're standing. That's why you're wearing the armor. That's why you have a shield. Because you are going to be attacked. 
Don't be surprised if you get discouraged. Don't be surprised if things happen. Don't be surprised if in the flesh you start questioning. I've, I've spoken to people who've even questioned the existence of God, believers, because they are at that place where they've had so many attacks. They are so worn down. And God can work with us wherever we are at, as long as we're real with Him. But we are called as believers to armor up and to stand. There are times when you may feel like giving up and just going with the flow. It would be so much easier. It's so much easier to go with the flow. But is that what you were made for? Just to be one of the masses just being swept away to perdition? Or were you created for something greater? You were created with destiny in your veins. You were created to be those who go up. No matter how challenging that climb is, no matter how narrow the gate is, that is what you were birthed for. But it takes effort. The muscles get tired, the brain gets tired, the emotions get tired. But we are called to stand in His strength, on His authority. We are called to stand. We are soldiers in the Lord's army. What a privilege that is. Even if we give our life in this, on this battlefield as soldiers in the Lord's army, it's okay because it's only a matter of time when we're going to be in eternity anyway. Are we standing for Jesus is the question. Are we prepared to pay the price like the Apostle Paul was prepared to pay? We are not hirelings. We are not those who are just seeking a problem-free life, I hope. Because if you're seeking a problem-free life, it's very difficult to follow Jesus. Jesus never promised you a problem-free life. He says, in this world, there will be tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome. That's where we need to be taking heart. That Jesus is the overcomer, not in the problem-free because the enemy is the one who offers the problem free. The enemy is the one who offered Jesus all the cities. The enemy is the one who offered Jesus the bread to eat or to throw himself off the steeple because the angels are going to catch him. That, these, these are the words of the enemy. Jesus said this life's going to be tough, folks. But take heart, I've overcome. Are you an overcomer who takes heart in Jesus? Because we need to stand. We need to recognize that the world is being led by their noses to the slaughter. We could change some of the outcome of those people's lives. Maybe some of them are in your family. Or some of them you are aware of. They are just being led about by their noses. And they are on their way to eternity without Jesus. We are soldiers in the Lord's army. We are wearing the armor of God. We are called to stand. And we are called to reach out so that others can also stand. We know that we are birthed with destiny flowing through our veins. It wasn't a mistake that you were born. God knew. He was knitting you. He was knitting you together in your mother's womb. That's how personal we get from Psalm 139. A personal God who was putting you together. He was knitting. What was he knitting? Spirit, soul, body. He was knitting talents, giftings, nature. He was knitting the you who you are together. Because that's exactly the way he wanted you to be. And some of you are stronger and some are weaker. Some are more emotionally strong. Some are more physically strong. Some are brighter at math, and some less so. Some are good at directions, and some are pathetic at directions. We are all unique because God's created us that way. In our uniqueness, He has given us our armor, and He's called us to stand. We are birthed with destiny flowing through our veins. We need to see ourselves as that. We are not victims in this world. 
We are victors in Christ Jesus. We are children of the Most High God. We are designed for greatness and for purpose. And we were born for such a time as this. Not a mistake that you are on earth now. You might say, oh, I'd rather have been 20, 30 years earlier. Yeah, sure. Me too. But God has got us here now for a reason, for a purpose. The armor he's given us is for now. It's not for 30 years ago. It's for now. It's time that we rise to that purpose. I know there are days when you can conquer Everest and there are days when you just want to lie down and sleep. As they say, some days you're the pigeon, some days you're the statue. Say no more. But if we don't learn the art of standing during the sunshine as well as during the rain, it's just a matter of time for the enemy to catch us on the wrong day. Standing takes persistent perseverance. It's through thick and thin. When you stand, you sometimes take a hit and you have to lean into the punch, as it were. But you've got armor. That's why God gave you the armor and the shield. Because he knew if sometimes you're going to take a hit. But without that mindset of persistent perseverance, you'll never achieve the fullness of what God has for you. Satan's attacks are meant to distract you and to cause you to give up on even trying. It's not worth it. That's the lies of the enemy. It's not worth it. And God is saying, I love you, my son. I love you, my daughter. I want to spend eternity with you. Come and feast with me. And the enemy, what does he offer you? Death and destruction. Standing is the stubbornness of opposition against these attacks. Sometimes it's good to be stubborn. Maybe growing up you're told, oh, you're so stubborn. There's a time when stubbornness is good. When the enemy's coming against you and you put that stubborn forehead and you say, hey, I'm not budging. That's good. Hallelujah. Being told in the wor word that we have to stand indicates that we're going to be attacked. Otherwise, you wouldn't have to stand. It indicates that we need to be bold and not frightened or intimidated. That we need to be fixed in our position and not double-minded. We need to be focused. We cannot afford the luxury of self-pity, which takes our focus off God and onto ourselves. We cannot afford that. We need to be on our position and we need to be alert, as the Word tells us. We need to give no thought to retreating or giving up. Take those things as soon as they come and chuck them out. The same as fear. Bind it and chuck it out in Jesus' name. Don't let it take up residence. We stand in the knowledge that God has called us to stand. When you stand, you are doing a godly thing. You are doing that which God has told you to do. God always equips you to be able to do what he calls you to do. He equipped Moses, even though Moses didn't feel he was good enough for this task. God equipped him. He always equips you for that which he calls you to. God always pays for the pizzas he orders. We stand after being fully armored up. We stand. And I can imagine Paul as he is in prison, in the Roman prison, and he's got all these Roman guards. Some of the, sometimes he was even chained to the Roman guards. And he had lots of opportunity to look at their outfit and for God to speak to him and to speak to him about the different things, the breastplate of righteousness and, and God just imparting wisdom into Paul as he looked at these soldiers. But this isn't a message of explanation about the various aspects of armor which the believer needs to be wearing. It's a message of standing, a simple message. All I'm saying today, when you walk out of there, all I want you to remember is, I need to stand. No matter what, I must stand. Because that is what this passage is telling me for this day. Picture a large rock at sea. I love the sea. I love the waves that come in and crash on the rocks. Picture one of these rocks. The wave is constantly crashing upon it. That rock stands. It stands through the daytime. It stands through the night. You can go any time that rock is standing. 
It stands through the summer months and it stands through the winter months. It stands when the sun is shining and the waves are just tickling it. And it stands through the worst of storms when the waves are beating down on it. Do you get the picture? That's what standing is. After you have done all, you stand. You ought to stand no matter what is happening. No matter how discouraged you might get. That's why it's good to have other believers around you who can encourage you at a time when you feel discouraged. How well are you standing? Not in your strength. Your strength might be finished. With everything that's happened recently, quite possibly your strength is finished. But we're not called to stand in our strength. We stand in His strength, wearing His armor, fixing your eyes on Him. Fix your eyes on Jesus as you stand in the knowledge that you are called to stand, that you are given armor to stand. Having done all, stand. Heavenly Father, I've delivered that message that you've given to your people for today. And I ask through the power of your Spirit that you would help us to appropriate this message of standing of standing for our Jesus, of not being blown about by the winds of change, but standing with our eyes fixed in the knowledge that we are eternal beings, both this side of the grave and other side of the grave. We want to be in your presence. That is our number one. Help us, Lord, to, to be prepared to pay the price, whatever that price is. For some people it's high like the Apostle Paul and for others it's less so. But it always comes at a price. May we be those who have counted the cost and are prepared to pay the price. Give us, Lord, a persistent stubbornness in standing. Would you fill each one of us afresh, Lord, with your Holy Spirit of perseverance an ability to stand. It is your enabling grace that enables us to stand. We are asking for a fresh dose of that this morning. Bless your people. Bless them, Lord, in the challenges that they are facing. And may they see, Lord, your hand of blessing, of protection, of favor, of provision. As they look to you, Lord, would you connect with them and be their God as only you can be in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift His countenance upon you and give you peace. Be blessed. Amen.